I believe we all would agree this morning that one of the great qualities that you can have in your life towards someone else is the ability to sympathize and uh, the ability to empathize with another person. I, I readily accept that we will all have that in some measure. One person compared to another may excel in that quality than the person that they sit next to. But I believe we will all recognize this morning that there is a need for it and we appreciate it when it comes our way as well. We certainly will value those who can do a lot more than simply talk, the ability to listen, and not just simply to listen, but to understand what you're saying, and then to give you the feedback, uh, which is right and good at that time. Now, the basis of all such sympathy and empathy, and I speak, first of all, from the human perspective, lies within the realm of the personal experience. Now, what I say from the human perspective, that's not removing it from the truth of our Lord Jesus Christ, because the point is, of Scripture, is that he has suffered being tempted, and therefore he's able to sympathize and to succor us in our need. But let's, before we go there, just think of it in a very simple human level before we go any further. We know that all sympathy and empathy lies within that realm of personal experience. Uh, do we not say to ourselves when we hear of someone's harrowing or heartbreaking experience in life, maybe something that you've never gone through, and you will say to such a person, I feel for them, uh, it, it must be awful, it must be terrible, but having never gone through that, how can I possibly understand what they're suffering or what they're going through at that time? That's a very understandable point of view to adopt, and it's one that we've all done in our lifetime. In fact, I'll go even further and say that it's often common, especially maybe when say those who are not Christian and won't th see things from a biblical perspective, that many can get insulted by those who casually come along and say, I understand how you feel, and such a person thinks in return, you've never been through what I've been through. How can you possibly understand my agonies, my pain, and my suffering? Again, those who are not Christian will often struggle in these areas when they will fight and battle with their own personal pains and sufferings. And a degree of bitterness can be certainly very much overcome or overcoming them in their life. This makes the matter of sympathy and empathy, we should see a very needful one and a very sensitive one at the same time. Certainly those who have been through much in their own life are more qualified to understand the trials of others. I, I, I do believe, honestly, in, in the light of Scripture, that, that many believers who go through all sorts of trials and tribulations, the Lord is using them to be a means of strength and help to others. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I am saying as I look at Scripture and I see the experiences of believers over the years that God in His infinite wisdom will allow His children on occasions to suffer to such an extent that they will be able to come alongside a brother or sister and offer that sympathizing tear. And what a ministry that is in its own right. It's often remarked how the minister of the gospel himself will go through many heart-rending trials and tribulations. And that he can be subjected to deep trials and temptations. And I believe it's for the same reason. That such may be able to preach and pastor in a way that they understand their people. I don't think there's anything worse than a man preaching behind a pulpit who is not touched by his people. Who is not those who identify with the sufferings and the needs that those people have in front of him. I've got, I've got a great need myself to constantly be before the Lord and to have such a heart towards you and to all who hear the word of God. Now we can look over history and think, I guess, of multitudes of, of, of men of God who are ministers and even women of God who serve in other capacities in the mission field and, and see what, a, what an example they are as, as individuals who have suffered and yet with their suffering, they're able to enter into other people's troubles. I think one standout example is William Carey, a Baptist missionary to India uh, towards the end of the 18th century, and he died in 1834. He was a, a pastor beforehand, and he spent 41 years in the mission field. 
tremendously serving the Lord, translating the scriptures. He never returned to England. He was a man that, for many reasons, went through the mill, we must say. His first wife was called Dorothy, and um, he was 25, and uh, well, she was 25, he was 19 when they married, and she was very reluctant to go to India in the first place, and only went after much persuasion, and on the basis that her sister would go as well. I'm not sure how that would go down so well in our current day. Um, I'll go if my sister goes with me at the same time, but that was the, that was the condition that was laid down uh, by this lady, Dorothy. Uh, she was there for some time. Now, after the death of their five-year-old son, she became very mentally unstable. And she remained so until her own death, which was 26 years after they had married. So you think about that. Uh, 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 William Carey, a pastor, then going into India to serve the Lord. And, and, and already there's a, a degree of tension within the marriage in how it begins. And they're going out to serve the Lord. And then their child dies at five years old. And then her, her needs, which arise, of course, afterwards. And, and, and you think of the, the, the difficulty that was, leaving behind seven children. So these, these were immediate pressures, weren't they? Immediate burdens which came upon William Carey. He then married uh, Charlotte, who had been made disabled by a fire when she was young. She met William Carey in India, and he was encouraged by her warm spiritual life. But then she died 13 years afterwards. And so here was a man that was now bereaved again. He married again. Grace was his third wife. She was a widow herself, and, he, and she cared for William Carey in his 11 last years of his life. And I think to myself, coupled with all of the experiences he went through, and then, folks, throw into the mix all of the trials of the mission field. All of those hurdles and burdens that he had to overcome. All of those firsts which he had to see, which no one else would ever see. If you were to dissect the spiritual content of William Carey's heart, I'm sure there were bruises and wounds, and heartaches and scars of many a nature. And it here was a man, like many before him and many afterwards, that was then able to be entering into the agonies and the sufferings of the people that he was sent by God to minister unto. So often, the preacher and the pastor will go through such things so the Lord will equip such to be able to be an efficient pastor to his people. Is there a pattern? Is there a template for this? Of course there is. Because greater and higher still is our Lord Jesus Christ. It would be one thing for me this morning to bring to you the need for empathizing and sympathizing, but that would just simply be morality to some extent. It would be something else for me to bring you a message about you know, God's people that can enter into other trials because they've been through them as well, and there's a degree of help in that type of, type of ministry, but, but we've got to move on to a higher plane. You see, when you look at Scripture and you come here specifically to Hebrews 2, what does the Lord do through his word? He turns all of his needy, grieving, tried and tested people to one alone, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. To this great verse of Scripture that we have here in verse 18, when he says, and that he himself have suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. Now in Hebrews 2, verse 18, as with the chapter in its entirety, what we do, folks, we enter into a special area of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me say this, only made possible. This is where we need to get our theology spot on. Only made possible because the Son of God took humanity to himself and became Man, you see those that undermine the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and those that will say that he's not fully God, or those even in the past time, not so much in present times, but certainly in the early days of Christianity, the humanity of Jesus Christ was under great assault and attack. When such charges and accusations are made, people do not understand the repercussions of such error. Because he is almighty God, he's tempted without sin. And because he is holy man, he understands every aspect and avenue of suffering that you and I go through. 
You remove one of those pillars, one of those great truths falls to the ground. You understand the importance of these things? In this context, it's his, his humanity that comes to the fore. Because the Son of God, the eternal Son, takes humanity to himself. He became man, our flesh, our blood, our bones, a true reasonable soul. He dies in that form, for sin, defeating Satan. And then with this glorious consequence, as the Apostle says, on many occasions, he is able. He's able to succor, to have compassion. In the word of our message, he's able to sympathize with all who are tempted. I think this is a needful message. There's never, a, we might say, a time when we do not benefit from such words as these as there. And I trust that as we think about our sympathizing Savior, that the Lord will come alongside you where you are right now, whatever trial, temptation that you're going through, whatever burden has come upon your heart, and that the Lord's word will minister to you and lift you closer to him. And then also it will help us as Christians to sympathize more with each other in the light of Christ and his ministry for us. I have two things I want to leave with you this morning as we come to our message, very simple thoughts, but we're going to work them out with the help of God. First of all, I want us to think about the intensity of our Savior's sufferings. The intensity of the Savior's sufferings. We're going to come to the Lord's table very shortly this morning. It's a very fitting message in that respect. It prepares us for the partaking of the Lord's table. The intensity of his own sufferings. Verse 18, as the apostle draws all that he says to a, a summary, you might say, a conclusion, he, he draws the reader to this point of application, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted. Now, what I want to see something here, which is simple in what I'm saying, but it's necessary to understand, is the reality of Christ's suffering. That, that is the, the, the emphasis which... The apostle is placing now upon these words. He's driving home the message. He's saying to those to whom he's writing, you've got to understand this thing. The, the entering of Christ, the eternal son, and he takes humanity to himself. In that flesh, he knew suffering. He knew it more than we ever possibly understand. And I want to emphasize that as strongly as I possibly can. He himself suffered being tempted. This is part of a tremendous portion of scripture where you will discover the reasons for his humanity are laid out very clearly from verse 14 right through to the end. Have you noticed something very important about this whole chapter? The nature was of Abraham, the apostle says. The nature was of Abraham. The, the seed of Abraham the humanity, the, the line that comes from him. He's you and me in that sense. Not angels. Not angels. And, and whenever I think about this, I'm truly amazed by this. There was no plan of the eternal God to save the fallen angels. The angels that fell with Satan. No intervention for them. No, no we we'll say, second chance for them. The angels that fell, that's it, reserved in those chains to everlasting damnation. No intervention for them. But for those of us made in the image of God, how condescending, O oh love divine, what hast thou done? The immortal God hath died for me. He, he, he deigns, his, his wisdom is, is so revealed that he condescends to intervene for those he's made in his own image. Not the angels that sinned, but us. What a wonder of all wonders. Now the main truth of this passage is that Christ became man principally to do one thing in two parts. I was saying to Brother Cole yesterday when we were also suffering from the cold in the church, trying to listen to the sound. Um, so with a two days of freezing conditions in this situation, I was just telling about a conversation I had with a lady on the phone the other day. And it, it just it brings it back to me now because it, it, it's reinforced even more this need to keep explaining what the gospel is because I can't take for granted that people understand what it is. 
She ran, she was listening to the radio. She's a very troubled individual, very needy areas of her life. We pray for her. I won't give out a name in a public sense like this. But pray for her. And, and, and as I listened to her, she asked for prayer. She asked for, for, for wisdom and all the help. I, I could sense that she had not grasped Christianity. And I asked her the question, you know, are you a Christian? Do you know, can you explain what it is? And she couldn't. This was the answer. Um, if we live pure, if we try our best, if we keep doing these things, everything, everything but understanding what is it to be justified by God. And you know, the more I think about that poor woman, and I think about many others around in the city in which we live, that live under the banner and the sort of veneer of a Christian faith and a very broad spectrum of Christianity, it really troubles me to think how many are actually not even converted and have never been saved. And you know what? So often the problem lay within this pulpit. I'm not saying this pulpit here, but a pulpit from where words of God should be preached in that they have not set forth the whole counsel of God as to what the gospel is. So I say to you, why must there be the incarnation? Why must God become man? And we must stress to men and women and to our own hearts this reason. This is what Jesus Christ has done to fulfill the law in its command because we cannot and to die for the penalty of sin that we deserve. In other words, to take our place, to be in our room, to be in our stead. Him for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And for that to happen, we need the incarnation. So listen, before we go any further in understanding the sympathizing nature of the Savior's hearts towards us, there is no appreciation of a sympathizing Savior unless you understand that the, that, that the Son of God has taken our humanity to die for sin, to bring us to himself, to make us his children, to reconcile us, that he might then be our high priest, our friend, our Savior to sympathize with us in our need. This is the great meaning of the passage. He cannot and will not die as God. And therefore, to reconcile God to man, he must do this. He must become man. And many things follow as a result. Satan is destroyed in, in terms of the, uh, the blow upon his head. And then we'll know one day the eventual uh, eradication of him as he's thrown into the hell which is prepared for him in the lake of fire. Satan is destroyed. Those who are now delivered in their bondage, their liberation through Jesus Christ. Verse 17 goes on with these glorious consequences. He, he, he's made like unto his brethren to be a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now, this is what I'm saying to you here. The apostle is doing this. He's establishing something very important here. As we see the merit of Christ and we see all the work that he's done, we see him now in the activity of him as our great high priest. So all of those high priests and priests of the Levitical order that you read of in Old Testament scriptures, all pointing to the great high priest and in the capacity of our Savior as the great high priest, he is touched and he enters into all of your needs. That's the thought process that the Lord is bringing to us here through the Holy Spirit. This was to reconcile God to man, chiefly, verse 18, it was pertaining to man, God to man. But there's also the benefit that we receive as those who are his children. We then receive his uh, compassionate heart. He sympathizes. And so verse 18 is the climax of this. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able. Folks, I want you to think about the ways in which such suffering compares of ours. The ways in which such suffering compares with our suffering. Now this will bring us to a lesson maybe we've learnt before on previous occasions, this lesson regarding the word tempted in the Greek. But I, I say it again for those that maybe have not heard it before, I think it's a really important lesson to learn when we study words in Scripture. 
The word tempted in the Greek has a far more general meaning than it does in our English equivalent. So, for example, if I immediately said to you um, the word tempted, I think you would immediately incline your thoughts temptation to sin. That would be the immediate thought that you have. And you're, you're right in one understanding of the word, but the Greek is broad and it sometimes can mean something else. The context will tell you. It does not always refer to inducement to sin as we think of it, like I've mentioned just now. Uh, it, it will often actually mean being put to the proof or tried and tested. Trial is the other meaning of the word. The trial of your faith is to some extent a temptation of your faith. It's a trial of it. The troubles of life are of this nature. So we can be tried, we can be subject to sufferings to test our devotion to God and to purge our lives and bring us closer to him. But then it can also have another meaning. As I've indicated, it can mean a strong inducement to sin. One of the classic um, portions in the Bible that you should turn to to see both words functioning side by side is James chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. You'll know these words well. James 1, verse 12 and 13. Listen to James's words. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man. What? You endure temptation to sin? No, of course not. You don't endure temptation to sin. You run from sin. You flee from sin. You don't endure the temptation to sin against God. So James isn't talking in that verse about temptation to sin. He's referring to what? Trials of your faith. And he says this, believer. He says, blessed is that man or woman who endures the trial of their faith. You don't shun the trial. You don't complain about the trial. You don't say to God, remove this trial from me in a sort of impatient manner. But you endure it by his grace. Why? He shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. But then he says this in verse 13, straight afterwards. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. What? Are you talking about the same thing, James? No, he's not. He's now talking about temptation to sin. Why? Because God will never induce a person to sin. That would be a violation of God and his nature. So don't say that you're tempted to sin, that's of God. God doesn't tempt you with evil. He neither tempts any man, but he'll certainly send us trials. Of course, we're never to endure those strong temptations to sin, as I say. But we are to recognize that there is a blessedness in the trial of our faith. So you understand that the word temptation and trial have different meanings depending on what the scripture is teaching us here. Now, what, when we come to our Savior, both are true in his life. Do you understand that? I really hope that you do. For he, for in that he himself have suffered being tempted. But, it, but in the, 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 the umbrella of that word, it, it's surely a reference to both. Our Lord Jesus Christ, he knew the trial of his life. I mean, that, that goes without saying, doesn't it? The Christian, he was hated. He was despised. He was forsaken. He was rejected. He was tried. And he knew it, and he felt it, and it was sore and hard and grieving. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. These were trials, weren't they? Do you not see them? Do you not sense them? Do you not recognize them? But he was also tempted to sin. Thank God, without sinning, the impeccable Savior could not and would not. But that does not lessen the agony which he felt when he was tempted to sin. And, the, and the, we might say the, the force of it and the heaviness of it. Satan tempted him to sin. In Matthew 4 is one occasion. We should remember those days of strong temptation. That Satan did his best to make all of those alluring promises. Something that would captivate him to bring the Son of Man into reproach. And so he knew that too. And what the Apostle is telling us here and the Lord is teaching us, dear Christian is that whatever it's a trial of your faith or it's a temptation to sin that we all go through, maybe are currently enduring, you've got one that knows. And there is a sense in which we can compare one to the other when we think of the sufferings of our Lord. 
But we need to also step back and remind ourselves that there are ways in which this suffering is what we should say incomparable, that is without comparison. Now, how is that true? How, how is the temptation of Christ not like ours? Because we should think about this, it's very important. Always remember that none suffered like our Lord Jesus Christ did, because none have endured such a burden as his. No matter how intense your trouble is going to be, or has been, or shall be, none like his. And you say, well, but I, I can think of you know, people that have, have gone through a multitude of heartbreaking situations that I read of in the Gospels that Christ never went through. That's not the point. The point of this is, who is he? Who is he? Who are we dealing with here? We're dealing with the almighty God, the creator of the ends of the earth, and his true human flesh and blood that's without sin and shame and reproach. And in this, he suffers being tempted. So we think of our tears, and they're many, and they're painful, but not like the tears which our Savior wept. Not like those tears which he wept, knowing that Lazarus had died, even though he was going to restore him to life. Then when he looked over a city, and he wept over its rejection, its sin, and its rebellion, not like his tears. Not like the solitary nature of the times when he was rejected. Not like his sorrow. Not like his grief. What about when he was tempted to sin? And you say, well, there's no way he could sin. So was it a real temptation? Of course it was. Of course it was. You see, here's the difference. When we are tempted to sin, even though we are now, if we are saved, indwelt by the Spirit of God, it is, it is still with an existing uh, nature, might say, or even to be more spe- uh, specific, with a, an existing form in our bodies, this, this, this sin which is still present, the limitations of our body, the fact that we are... On occasions, really, we've become desensitized. We've become hardened over the years. We've become, to some extent, accustomed, even with the the deceitfulness of our own lives. And, And even though we shun these things and we don't want these things and we grieve over them, when you think of the temptation of Jesus Christ to sin, even though he did not and could not sin, it was like acid to newborn skin. That's how you've got to see it. It was overwhelmingly intense. When people say to you, it's a white lie, it's a small sin. No. No. And you want to understand why that is no? You think of the impeccable nature of our Lord Jesus Christ and the temptation for him to sin and reproach God. Can you imagine? The weight of that. So when we feel, dearly beloved, at our wit's end, when you're almost gone, when that temptation is too much, when that trial is too hard, there is one that sympathizes with you. Aren't you in awe of this? Do you know what? There's no other religion that has that message. No other religion. Go through all the religions of men, all the cults which have come and gone, and there is no message like this. You have a sympathizing Savior. I want to finish with this last thought this morning, and that is the assurances of his compassion towards you and us. The assurances of his compassion. And and it's simply expressed in that phrase, he is able. Verse 18, he is able to succor, he's able to help you. He's able to help them that are tempted. Dearly beloved, these are assurances for all of his people. I'm so glad that this morning, this message that I have to give to you, I can sort of look at you, where you are, and whoever watches online, and if you're a child of God, I can say with absolute confidence, this is God's message for you. Sometimes I'm a little bit mindful that if I preach on a certain subject, that people might be looking and hearing and thinking, is that for me? Every message is for people, by the way. Every word of God is for you. But you understand the point I'm trying to make here in terms of its very simple application. This is for you. He's able to succor you where you are. And you say, but I'm I'm in too difficult a place. No, no. Are you really going to override the authority of God's word with your experiences? He's able to help you right now. 
You're wallowing and you're struggling. And people have, and we've seen this over the news recently. He's able to help you. We've got to think about this very carefully this morning. These are assurances for all of his people. Them that are tempted. That puts me into that category. It puts you there, doesn't it? This was the pathway of our Lord and our Savior. And, and, and look at the greats in the Bible and church history. In, in the Christian church, some of the most godliest of men and women, and, and then they're not exempt from pains and sufferings and temptation. They all derive comfort in the truth this same way, that it was the way of the Master. Peter, when he writes to believers in Jerusalem, he's reminding them, don't think this is strange. 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, one of the, the, the responses of the Christian when you are put through the trial and the furnace is that we are not to go, why me? Why me? But rather we are to understand that this is part of the divine purpose of God. I know it's hard, and I know it's sore, and I know it's painful, but it's certainly not strange. And it shouldn't be unexpected. Why? Peter says, but rejoice. It's a, it's a bold word, isn't it? A courageous minister to stand before a grieving people and say, uh, actually, can you rejoice in your trial? Oh, well, I, I, want, I, I want to grieve. That, that's fine, but also rejoice. Why? But how can you rejoice? Give me the reason. How do you rejoice? Peter says, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You partake of the sufferings, then you've got the pledge and you've got the guarantee of greater things which are to come. That's what you've got here. Verse 17, we're told in Hebrews 2, going back to our text here, in all things it behoved him, it was necessary to be made like unto what his brethren, to his dear people. It would then be unusual if our pilgrimage did not resemble his, wouldn't it? It's the way of the master. These assurances that he will succor and help are for all them that are tempted. Those who in such times turn to him for this needful support. There is help for you in him. Also, and I'll finish here, these assurances are founded upon what he can do. I want this to be the last thing we remember and really stress this morning. These assurances of his sympathy are founded on what he can do because of who he is. He is able to do this. He doesn't pretend to care. We all see that through those sort of people, don't we, that pretend to care about what you're going through and don't really. Not, not with the Lord. Not even, even the most... Um, sympathetic of people that you know of, even the closest person next to you, someone that you're maybe married to, or your, your, your father, or mother, or child, or a friend, or a neighbor, even me as your, as your pastor here. And we will, we will do all that we can at times to express the sympathy that we have and, we, and the love that we have towards you. But listen, we fail you because we are finite. And so what do we do? We direct you to one who is able. He's eternally able. He is inf infinitely able. He is unchangeably able to help you. He is your sympathizing saviour. This is what he can do and will do. This is who he is. He is set apart from all others. There's none like him. In Hebrews 4, verse 15, we're told of the ministry of those high priests that went before him. And what is it that the apostle says? He, he draws the distinction through a double negative. He says, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And what is he saying here? You have a high priest who is touched. But he uses this double negative to emphasize it even more. He's touched with the feeling of your infirmities. He's moved, he's touched, because he too was tried in all places, yet without sin. You say, well, I've sinned. And I've fallen aside. And I'm broken. And I'm crushed. So what, what help is there for me? Let me direct you to another lovely verse here. Because he is this one. He's the one that brings us back into the way as well. 
as long as we turn to him and seek him. That's the, the what I say, the, the necessity and the important part of this message. Look at Hebrews 5 and verse 2. For every high priest, again, he's drawing the comparisons between old and new. Every high priest is taken from among men. He's ordained for men. And things were taken to God that he may offer both uh, gifts and sacrifices for sins who, c- who can have compassion on the ignorant uh, and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. But the application is this. If that's what the earthly sinful, finite, temporal high priest was called to do. That was his office. He was to offer gifts. He was to offer sacrifices. And he was to have compassion on the ignorance, the unlearned, and those that had gone out of the way. That is why he was mindful of his own infirmities. So in a far greater sense, the Lord who has gone through the darkest of valleys and the most intense of trials, even when we are out of the way, he brings us back into the way. He has compassion on us. But we must look to him. All of this was, we might say, not so much upon a condition, but really annexed with this necessity that we must look to him, lean on him, rest on him, go to him, flee to him, fall on him, be found in him. Never underestimate, my dearly beloved, uh, dear child of God, how tender the heart of Christ is, how willing and able he is to help those that seek him by faith. But you have to go to him. I know your trial and your burden is hard, but you've got to give it to him. I know the temptation is sore, maybe it's overwhelmed you, but you've got to confess it, get rid of it, and go to him. You'll never know the benefit of a sympathizing Savior unless you live near the heart of Christ. Thank God we have a sympathizing Savior. May the Lord comfort us through his precious and holy word.